uh, we're going to start with this session uh, on a, a topic that is dear to all our hearts, uh, happiness. I just have a quick uh, flag to raise. Um, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Achim Steiner, uh, who is the administrator at UNDP, is actually uh, stuck in a meeting about happiness. But that's a good sign because when people meet uh, to uh, implement the topics that we talk about, we can rest assured that uh, whatever topics we talk about here at the World Government uh, Summit uh, is actually being put into an action plan. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to uh, say a few words in Arabic now. Masa al khair, ismi Faisal Abbas min Arab News. Hakun muhawirkum al yom. Session hakun bilugh al inglizia. استأذنكم اللي يحب يستمع للسيشن ويستخدم جهاز الترجمة موجود على الكراسي. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our uh, panels uh, for this afternoon. Um, as you know, the topic of happiness or the pursuit of happiness uh, has been a philosophical debate for centuries. Um, philo philosophers have tried to crack what makes us uh, happy. Um, the UAE was actually a pioneer in having uh, the first ever minister uh, of uh, happiness. And uh, I am delighted that the first ever minister of happiness in the world uh, ha is with us on this panel, Her Excellency uh, Uhud uh, Ar-Rumi, who's gonna talk a little bit about her role uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, how do you quantify or uh, how do you put action uh, plan for uh, such a complicated uh, topic that I said it's been um, uh, humanity has been struggling with with uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Akim Steiner, who, as I said, will be joining us uh, shortly. Um, but we also, on our panel, we have His Excellency Jose Angel uh, Goria, who is uh, the Secretary General at OACD, uh, the Organization for uh, Economic Cooperation uh, Development. Um, I'm going to uh, jump right into the conversation uh, by asking Her Excellency Ahud the question which I'm sure uh, on is of everybody's mind. How do we measure happiness? Uh, thank you, Faisal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. But before talking about uh, measuring happiness and well-being, let me talk a uh, little bit about the why. So we know that the world today is wealthier than ever before. However, there is global agreement, increasing global agreement, that the rising levels of inequality have become the issue of our time. Yep. So while the economic indicators like GDP numbers have doubled during the past few decades, we see worsening levels in life indicators. And let me give you a few examples, if you allow me. Since 1980, obesity rates in 70 countries have doubled. Mental disorders today affect one in four people. And in some countries, loneliness is affecting more than 50% of the population. On top of that, we are approaching the fourth industrial revolution, which by all scenarios will increase the wealth of the world. However, this revolution will put more pressure on the life indicators, such as depression, mental disorders, People will lose their jobs. I know that there will be uh, new jobs created, but losing the jobs will create a crisis within people, what I call purpose crisis, because most of us, we take the value of our life from our work. We take the purpose of our life from our work. And I think in the near future, where we have all these variables, what will matter most for citizens around the world is being comfortable, healthy, and happy. And these three are the definition of well-being in Webster Dictionary. And at OECD have a similar term, there is more to life. And we believe in the UAE that the future of government is GDP and beyond. And I'm quoting you, Mr. Guria, because this was your word in our session in Davos. We believe in the UAE that the government should be pivoted, the future of governments should be pivoted on well-being because well-being is what makes life worth living. Very happy with your answer because it begins to quantify uh, the question of happiness. 
in simple terms, uh, you cannot uh, have happiness without uh, well-being. Uh, you mentioned also a very important point, which is beyond uh, GTP. This is where I would like to take the conversation uh, to uh, His Excellency. We have seen countries in the world uh, which surpass uh, uh, perhaps us in the Arab world in terms of their GDP, in terms of their uh, growth. Uh, countries, for example, like uh, perhaps Germany or the United States, um, but uh, as Her Excellency has mentioned, we can see a lot of examples where a rise in GDP has also uh, been uh, paired with a rise in inequality, uh, in depression. Um, uh, so uh, has your organization found a formula that uh, you can follow uh, in your attempt to try to uh, make people happier? We uh, focus uh, on about uh, 11 different dimensions of what we call the Better Life Index. And Martin Durant here is the one who uh, developed that concept and also is the one who has been promoting it. And of course, uh, we produced together here and with the support of our hosts, the Global Council for Happiness and Well-Being, you know, and of course, uh, this, uh, I think the, the way to do it is like this, yes, because you start reading it from the other side, you know, look at, look at, this is the English version, and of course, this is the uh, Arabic uh, version, the Global Happiness and Wellbeing Policy Report of uh, 2019, um, and uh, uh, you, you have to find a way to measure these things. Measuring a distance to the uh, sustainable development growth targets, for example, the, 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 which are going to dominate uh, our next few years. Beyond GDP, as the minister mentioned, measuring what counts for economic and social performance, and uh, what we call for good measure, and that is uh, an exercise which uh, 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 Joe Stiglitz and uh, uh, Mr. Fitusi of France and Martine Durand herself are now doing, which is precisely to say, okay, not uh, beyond GDP, as the minister appropriately said, but GDP and beyond, which means GDP is a useful, uh, you know, measurement to calculate some things, uh, but it's uh, rough. It's uh, something which uh, may not uh, break down into the quality of life and we're working here and worried about the quality of life because happiness itself is about the quality of life. Uh, satisfaction is about the quality of life. Eventually, the perception of progress is about the quality of life, and therefore, the perception of well-being is about the quality of life. But there, you have to have things like uh, civic participation, uh, the quality of education, the quality of your health services. How uh, good is the quality of the public services that you receive in exchange for the taxes uh, that you pay? Uh, how uh, good is uh, the uh, security, the physical security around uh, your neighborhood? Can you uh, feel comfortable walking at night uh, in the neighborhood, but also how good do you feel about the security of your country, about the neighboring countries, about the neighborhood in the broadest sense, that means uh, in your region, in your continent, you know, in, in, in the world. So uh, the, the question is, uh, was very specific, do you have a formula? And by that time, you probably will have uh, uh, concluded that the OECD does not mean to have a formula, but because there is no single question that will say, if I get this right, I will get a very high level of way of being, or I will have happy people. Because you may have happy people for an instant, but the problem is they will not get a permanent feeling of well-being. There will be frustration. Now, let me just take you through very fast I was recently, the end of last year, with the, the Prime Minister of Czech Republic, and he 
has just been confirmed by his, uh, by his um, uh, uh, parliament the day before. He was so happy, you know, after nine months of trying to form a government. Mark Rutte in the Netherlands took seven months. Angela Merkel took five months to form a government. Sweden, of all places, the most egalitarian, you know, the, the land where the, uh, the you know, social democracy of Europe was uh, formed. In a, this is uh, Olaf Palme, you know, the, and Sweden took four months to form a government because now they have a 20% of the electorate who chose to go for the radical right and therefore, uh, you know, that could not, could not get an ink started. And then the outcomes in Italy, uh, minister, the fragmentation of the politics in Spain. What can I tell you about Brexit? Where the young people whose future was at stake didn't even choose to go and vote and now they regret it because, of course, their future is now being at stake. Uh, <laughs> confirmed that the future is at stake. And it's in danger because they will not be European citizens. They will not be citizens of the world, you know, because of this, uh, because they miscalculated and they thought that it was not an issue that they should go and participate. But the danger is they thought democracy was not good enough for them to solve their problems. So you're basically talking about the danger of democracy, of not believing in democracy because you're not satisfied with your level of well-being. And uh, so <clears throat> how about the United States, completely divided? How about Mexico to the left? How about Brazil to the right? I mean, you're talking about Examples in every continent, in every type of country, every size of country, small countries, big countries, fully, you know, uh, with, with full democratic traditions, with new democratic traditions, and all say one single thing. And that is there are hundreds of millions of angry people who are not happy, who are not feeling the well-being effect, who are not satisfied with what they see, and therefore, it's a multidimensional task that we have to address because we have to look at all these elements, uh, and particularly with the young, in order to make sure that eventually we can raise a level of, in the end, it's a lot about the trust. What, what, did, the, what did the crisis leave to us? It left us, you know, slow growth, we now have a second recurrence or third recurrence of the slow growth. High unemployment, with a few exceptions, we're still catching up. Then growing inequality. Welcome, Mr. Steiner. We are very happy that you can join. <laughs> growing inequality and then trust, trust, trust. Trust went downhill. It destroyed trust. And that is what we have to capture. This is what we have to get back. If we can increase the level of well-being, we will be able to increase the level of trust, and then we will recover that so precious that we lost with the crisis. Thank you, Mr. Gurria. Uh, you know, as an Arab, I would like you to add Lebanon to your list next time you mention, because it officially took uh, nine months and one week to form a government. Workshops. So, so uh, it's our contribution to uh, the, the, the world. Uh, maybe, maybe we should contribute in other things like we are seeing here uh, in uh, the UAE, but I'm glad our third uh, speaker could join us. Um, and let me just quickly brief you on uh, the points that we've raised. I started with uh, saying that the pursuit of happiness is actually a philosophical debate that humanity has struggled with for uh, centuries. Um, philosophers have uh, tried to tackle it. The UAE was actually uh, forward-looking by having the first minister uh, of happiness, and now the title has evolved to uh, happiness and well-being. Her Excellency was explaining the importance uh, of uh, well-being. Um, I jumped to Mr. Korea and uh, tried to ask if there is a particular formula uh, that they work, about, uh, they work on in his organization. And he was uh, just uh, before you arrived explaining that each country has it. I already gave him the secret of happiness, but I won't tell you now because <laughs> you're a That will make him very unhappy. So, so, so 
I will ask you the same question so that uh, we all get a chance to, to answer that question before we move to the next point in the discussion. Do you have the formula of happiness, Your Excellency? Yes. Great. <laughs> Job done. I have to keep up with Angel. Dr. Hood, good afternoon. No, first of all, my deep apologies. There was a meeting I was asked to attend very briefly, and that's why I'm late. But I knew that you are already being inspired, and I hope I can contribute a little bit to the discussion. A very simplistic way of answering is, well, in the United Nations, there is a conversation that began many years ago and culminated in 2015. So for want of not having found more inspiring words like happiness and well-being, it was called the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. And why do I say that? Because, you know, you might say, oh, goals, targets, indicators, that's hardly a recipe for happiness. No, there is no recipe for happiness. Happiness is something that has so many forces that come from the spiritual, from the emotional, from the relationship. So I think, put that aside for a moment, that's what philosophers also try to perhaps sometimes capture. But I think what happens in today's debate is that very often the economy becomes a source of unhappiness. And I think this is partly where we are all struggling. One is we are trapped, and I think Angel would not disagree with me on that, in measuring economic success since about 100 years in the crudest form of an indicator called gross domestic product. And when we grow that gross domestic product, we celebrate. Uh, in part, that's not unjustified, because if a cake is growing, there's always a little bit more for everyone. But what we've also noticed is that it is a very misleading indicator, because some of the fastest growing countries are amongst the unhappiest countries socially, uh, politically, uh, partly because of the issue of inequality. So what the Sustainable Development Goals try to do is to draw together the threads of literally 190 countries, journeys of learning, of failure, and of success. And you, know, you could argue it's almost a formula, because what the SDGs essentially say is that if you try and address development through these 17 perspectives, or if you address these 17 risks for unhappiness, then the likelihood that your society is more equitable, more sustainable, and therefore more able to thrive, and perhaps most importantly, the simplest phrase in all of this is leave no one behind. So that's at a societal level, and maybe I'll stop here, because then we come to the individual level and things get obviously much more diverse. So let me take the conversation back to Her Excellency uh, Uhud. When did the UAE come to the realization that we need to take the discussion about happiness beyond GDP. What was the trigger for that? I think the UAE story was not uh, a gap story. It, not, it was not about GDP not being good to us because we enjoyed uh, good growth in GDP, but it was more about the role of the government in general. I mean, um, uh, my Prime Minister, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, uh, frames the work or the higher purpose of the government on achieving well-being and happiness. And if we take this philosophy, it's not just add on to government. It's a paradigm shift that needs change on how we think about policies, how we do our services, and how we structure our bureaucracies. So for me, well-being is not just another portfolio added to the government structure. It needs hard wiring. Uh, it needs uh, shifting the mindset and the culture. And actually, we have a workshop on the last day of the summit about this. How can we redesign government, which we call the future of government, pivoted on well-being? How would the ministries look like? Do we need Ministry of Health? Or what would be the Ministry of Health on a future pivoted on well-being would look like or how it would look like? Um, I would like also to add that many governments around the world are realizing the importance of well-being and happiness. And we would like to thank the OECD and the UN for giving us practical tools. OECD have the Better uh, Life Index, UN have the Sustainable Development Goals. And we as government, we need practical tools. Okay, we say we want to measure success holistically, not just from economic perspective, but we need practical tools. And we have also the World Happiness Report, we have our report today. We would like to see more international organizations engaging in this dialogue to help us as countries move forward. We have the Global Coalition for Happiness of six countries, Mexico, Costa Rica, Slovenia, Portugal, UAE, and Kazakhstan, working together. But we would like to see more countries joining this movement. 
Uh, Mr. Greer, so I'll take the uh, question uh, to you since uh, Her Excellency uh, Ahud uh, spoke about uh, Mexico. We heard a little bit about the UAE uh, example and uh, the fact that they actually have a, a dedicated uh, minister. Um, when you sit with government representatives, um, you know, and they ask you, okay, how can we help you? Um, what what uh, are the factors that you try to install in uh, government decision makings around the world? And what would it take, in your opinion, to have more than just the countries that uh, Her Excellency Ahud uh, have uh, mentioned involved in this happiness coalition? I always tell them about Dubai. <laughs> she said, you should do like Dubai. You know? But if you won't do like Dubai or can't do by Dubai or cannot create another ministry or whatever, the question is the multifaceted uh, nature. As uh, Achim just said, oh, we have this measurement which we've been doing for 100 years. And as I mentioned before, we're trying to unfold it. And then what is the, what are the SDGs if not kind of the, the ultimate expression of mankind trying to reach to the more meaningful elements and also being able to measure them. Why is it so important to measure them? You know, this is 17 targets and you have 169, uh, uh, 17 goals and 169 targets and 230 indicators, which uh, Martine and her colleagues uh, with the UN uh, Statistics Commission put together to track what we're doing. Why? Because there isn't, in, and there's not even an attempt to build a composite to say, this is the single indicator of happiness or well-being or whatever. The, the complexity is accepted. And therefore, what we do is invite the government to say, take a dive into the complexity, understand the complexity, accept the complexity, accept the plurality, Accept the multi-level problem, the coordination between federal governments and regional governments and, and, and state governments and city governments and the local uh, governance uh, of, of the phenomena. Uh, because there are certain things which are absolutely national, like defense, but there are certain things which are very local, like water. And you have to work with the governance of the different issues at the different levels and that see who is dealing with what issues, you know? So you have to work in the coordination of things. But then uh, it's not just only about uh, see, being better coordinated. I was talking to uh, your, in your office, there is uh, a, a, an accelerator uh, of, that means basically coordinating people, getting them together. But it's also about getting the policies right. And the policies, there's always somebody else who already had that problem and somehow addressed it, you know, and, and, and already started to work on it and probably failed. And there are a lot of reasons, there are a lot of things that we can learn from the failures, but also some of them who did better and probably some of the things that we can learn. So there's also a clearing house of solutions that we should get better at. We don't need to be inventing the wheel every time and every time and every time. And last but not least, it's a question of the ambition. The, the, very simply, uh, the, the fact that Dubai has a ministry of uh, well-being and, uh, and, 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 and happiness shows a level of ambition and of going for the quality of life and for the better life in society that we all aspire to when some of the fundamental material needs have been satisfied, and then you are moving upwards in terms of the level of satisfaction and understanding that people is more than simply, you know, having the infrastructure or having the school or having the health, that they, they need more than that. They need to be able to nurture their aspirations. And this is what is exemplary in the case of Dubai. It, it reveals that level of ambition. And this is what we also try to inject in our dialogue with the other countries, whether they have a ministry of uh, happiness and, and well-being or not, but in their policy uh, recommendations.
Very good. Uh, I would like to go to Achim uh, and say, as both a thinker and an implementer in terms of sustainable development, if I ask you to take a step back and have a macro uh, look at the world, where would you say we went wrong and where do we go from here to achieve uh, what Mr. Goria has been uh, talking about? Maybe I would, I would turn it slightly around. Um, with hindsight, one can always judge those who went before us as having gone wrong. I think the, the tragic mistake is it being committed really in the last 10 to 20 years. I think before that, let's, let's acknowledge the 20th century, and I would take sort of a century as a bracket, was a century in which you know, economic takeoff, um, the advent of technologies, um, essentially allowed uh, you know, a couple of billion people to think that the planet really could be exploited, so to speak, for accelerated development, um, a little bit like cornucopia. And I think what became quite clear is towards the end of the, the 20th century is that actually this totally overriding economic paradigm, including the exploitation of uh, the ecological infrastructure of our planet, simply was no longer viable. The error is being committed in the era, the generation that we represent, which is not to recognize the urgency with which to rethink the paradigm. And I think it is no accident that, you know, in a region such as Asia, which is amongst the fastest growing in the last uh, 10, 20 years, these concepts of rethinking the paradigm that should drive and define development is now emerging in that part of the world, whether it is gross national happiness uh, in Bhutan, but not only there, the debates about sufficiency economy, uh, in China about ecological civilization. Many in the rest of the world, particularly in the West, still look at this as exotic, when in fact it is defining a far deeper rethinking about what matters. So, if you ask me to step back for a moment, I think the next 50, 100 years, I mean, who knows how long an era lasts, um, has really allowed us to broaden the way we will define development. And then we come very much to the connection of well-being. What is a society that is at peace with itself, that, that has an identity that it is comfortable with? And to put it in overly simplified terms, I think the two defining variables that will be at the center of the next paradigm that is emerging now are going to be equity and sustainability. I think they are the two defining variables with which we are rethinking the entire way in which we design our economies. And let me say, that's the 20th century way of describing our societies. And that's the other big switch. And from that vantage point, the mistake that is, in a sense, now so tragically being committed is that we are actually not understanding the urgency with which we need to do this because we are passing points of no return. That is almost without precedent in human history. And you're not talking about planetary uh, impacts that are being locked in. And I believe we will see in parts of the world that you know, traditionally would not have been considered, because you know the West has a certain inbuilt arrogance because of the 20th century, the advancements. It cannot quite fathom that actually the future is being reinvented in many other places. And I would even venture to say here today, when we talk about you know, a world government summit, um, perhaps it is going to be in Africa that the 21st century trajectory for development will actually find its ultimate expression, because there is one of um, truly reinventing for survival. But again, let's come back to the United Arab Emirates. Let's come back to Dubai. I don't think it is an accident that it was His Highness, Sheikh Martoum, who already four or five years ago embraced the notion of uh, the green economy as a defining and, and driving principle also for Dubai's next economic uh, period. There is so much happening, and what is holding us back is in a sense the, the legacy uh, infrastructure that we have, uh, rather than a lack of imagination or, or potential. Uh, great. So we do have one minute left. So I'm going to ask one question, and I would like a one-word answer. Uh, two words, it's okay, it's okay, because we want to make you happy. Uh, and we are at the World, Econom uh, World Government uh, Summit, and we are all about practicality. So if you were to have one wish, uh, what practical step would you like to see in government policy, be it in your country or across uh, the world? Uh, ladies first, we start with Her Excellency Ahud. Culture, culture and mindset. Culture and might. Would you elaborate a little bit? You said two words. So, I can't no, no, no. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, 
Mr. Graham. Awareness. Awareness. And then if I extend the op-ed like the minister, then I would design and implementation, but you know, starts with awareness. <laughs> Final word. Okay, at, at the risk of uh, not being understood, acceleration. I think it is government's extraordinarily important duty to accelerate transitions and transformations. It will not happen simply out of a normal process of markets and economies functioning, so acceleration. I would like to thank you all. You've done my job. Uh, my job as a moderator is to keep the audience wanting more. So thank you for your precise short answers, um, but I'm sure the audience would love to network and get a copy of the book and read it the right side up. <laughs> Where can we get a copy of the book? The web. On the web. The web. The web. Thank you so much. And on that note, thank you very much uh, for this excellent session, and we have to clear the stage. Thank you.